All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to uh, Backpacking 101 uh, by the Caltech Y Outdoors Committee. I'm Jimmy. Uh, that's Colin. Hi. Uh, we're both members of well, Colin. We're both members of the uh, Y Outdoors uh, Committee, uh, and uh, we like backpacking. And we're uh, looking forward to sharing with you some of uh, uh, our, our accumulated knowledge, which is by no means comprehensive. Uh, and uh, fun that we find in backpacking, maybe give you some ideas on the things you could do next time you want to have an outdoor adventure, uh, places you could go, or things like that. Uh, I want to start off with a slight disclaimer, as this is by no means like exhaustive, comprehensive, and if you've never gone before, I strongly recommend that you would go with somebody who has, because backpacking can be a little bit intimidating at first, and there's lots of like small nuanced details that we're not covering here. So this isn't supposed to be like a certification, you're ready to go, but more of like, if you've always wanted to go and it seems intimidating, here's, it's, we're trying to like demystify of some of the steps that, and some of the differences between hiking and camping and what makes it so much. Try to show that it's not this massive undertaking, but it is still a good idea to always go with a buddy who is uh, experienced. Therefore, when you're heading out to the woods, it's always good to be prepared. Uh, also want to say that at any time, uh, feel free to, uh, ask a question by unmuting it like at the end of the slide or raising your hand, or if you wanna just save it for the end, we'll have a time for questions. So either works, I mean, we can always go back to the slides. But uh, yeah, Caltech Y, uh, we in normal times like having, uh, taking groups of backpacking. Here's some pictures, I think both of them are probably from the Y hike in Yosemite. Uh, on the left is uh, Colin and I uh, in 2019. Uh, obviously right now we can't exactly do that, but if you have a small group of your like housemates things like that. Backpacking can be a fairly socially distanced activity as long as the uh, trails are uh, open and uh, you're following all proper, like, whatever the ranges have put out as precautions. So it's still something you can get out and do, it's just we can't take you through. But we're looking forward to hopefully in the future soon. Yeah, I've done a few backpacking trips recently, which I can talk about later on um, during the pandemic. So it's uh, definitely a, a sport or an activity that you can do uh, right now, which is nice. One of the perks is it is very uh, remote, <laughs> which actually segues quite well into uh, what is backpacking, which is uh, effectively, in, in a sentence, camping on the trail. Uh, you take hiking, you take camping, two activities that, uh, that we like, and hopefully you do as well, and you combine them. Why go back at the end of the day when you're enjoying the hike? You may as well sleep out there. Uh, and it, it becomes kind of, in my mind, one of the best ways to just kind of take a break from Silver Ridge and get out there, unplug, just uh, take a slightly different pace of life because there's, uh, you can't exactly go check your email when you don't have a signal. And I like to leave my cell phone behind in the car. Other people take it for pictures, uh, either way it works. Uh, and the, there's no homework to do. There's no, there's no research to be doing. You're just taking, you're taking a break, enjoying the scenes, uh, uh, letting go like sunset and actually like seeing the night sky, uh, which is, quite different than in the middle of downtown LA or any other city. Uh, I'm just having having some fun, having uh, enjoying your time outside. Uh, There's a picture from like a sunset on uh, the coast of Washington Peninsula uh, after a massive storm. <laughs> it's just kind of spectacular. Something, something different that you don't experience because normally you would just kind of weather the storm inside, but here we were quite wet and battered, but then suddenly the sunset comes out after the storm blowing past and it was it's kind of a great experience. Uh, so we're going to split up this talk into two parts. Uh, first is going to be kind of like basics on backpacking, kind of like uh, what are some of the differences between hiking and camping? Uh, what would you want to bring? Uh, where would we uh, go? And what do you need to prepare for some tips and tricks? Uh, and then in the second half, uh, Colin's going to go through a bunch of areas uh, in like Southern California and a little bit further afield. Uh, that are uh, good destinations if you're looking for somewhere to go and need some ideas. Uh, again, by no means exhaustive. There's many more places and more things you could do, but just kind of give you a broad overview and some ideas. Uh, so first, some of the differences between uh, hiking and camping. It's uh, I kind of touched on them briefly, uh, but some of the again, it's camping on the trail, which means that because you're going to be out there for more than one day, uh, by definition, you usually cover longer distances. A backpacking is a great way if you want to do a long trail that you could, well, most people couldn't uh, cover in a single day. A backpacking is a great option to do it in like 
it's somewhat paradoxically a less intense pace because even though it's maybe you're going to take two nights to complete it so three days of hiking uh if it was a 30 mile hike that's only 10 miles a day instead of trying to do a 30 mile hike in one day which would be exhausted <laughs> uh and you'd be rushing so you can more take your time uh you cover some territory, cover some ground and kind of explore areas and get more remote than you really could if you're just day hiking because you can really get out there. Uh, you can head somewhere that uh, may not take you back. Longer trips can last a week or even two. So you, you could really go but to, uh, to places that really isn't easy to get to uh, in a single day. Uh, for those, you usually though tend to do things like where you have food drops or you hike back for a town and hike back, back into the wilderness to make two weeks doable with the food you can carry. Uh, although some people uh, can get very intensive, uh, not me personally, but <laughs> there are ways to like, be super lightweight and actually go for longer durations. Like that. Uh, and then part of it, uh, if you, part of the, uh, what, what goes uh, hand in hand with it being longer distances, you can get more remote. Uh, and I, I, me personally, I feel like there's something different about being out in the spot for the day and then being out there overnight. And for me, it feels uh, personally, I feel like some of the like the most remote at least experiences have been like 10 miles, uh, 10, 12 miles up a trail, like in an area that's already pretty remote. Uh, I'm from uh, Wash, uh, Washington, Seattle area. So the Olympic Peninsula, which is the northwest corner of the continental United States, is already a really remote area. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, no one pretty much lives on the west coast of Washington, so it's kind of an interesting uh, feature of geography. So the whole peninsula is a national park, but you can drive past the last town and then hit the trailhead and hike 10 miles from that trailhead. So you're 10 miles away from the highway, which pretty much nobody goes on unless they're backpacking anyways. And you're up this uh, street, uh, creek and you haven't seen anybody all day. And uh, there's something like, there's something different about that, especially then when it's nightfall and you're just looking at dark sky and yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't on that like point that. too, uh, another really cool thing with backpacking, you can't really get with uh, just hiking. There's some spots where you, you'd have to wake up at really ungodly hours of the day to see during the sunrise um, and you can camp there overnight with a backpack. And when you wake up, it's the first thing that you see, which is uh, so, some of the best like moments that I've had backpacking are when the sun rises or when it sets. I mean, just being that far out, um, it's really, uh, really nice to see that. Yeah, it's just kind of a profound moment. You're just like, huh, I'm out here. <laughs> just a different pace. Uh, I, I, I have an astronomy uh, passion, so I like the dark sky. Uh, kind of a picture from a desert area. And uh, somewhat, th this is taken with an ast uh, astronomy uh, camera. So uh, it's not going to be quite the same. I think this is Joshua Tree. Uh, but it's close. With the, you're, it's you're, it's different with your naked eye. Your cameras can't quite capture it. It's something. It's something everyone should experience at least once. The truly dark skies and backpacking is a good way to do it. Uh, there is a. There are downsides in that because you're carrying your tent with you and you're carrying your food and you're carrying. Depending on where you go, you might be carrying a, certain, a decent amount of water uh, and other gear. Uh, your packs are going to be heavier, and that's something that means that it can be. Uh, some people find backpacking harder for that reason because you need to uh, at least be used to carrying weight. But there are ways to get around that by either distributing weight among multiple people, uh, having lightweight gear, uh, or packing, uh, knowing the weather well, so packing specifically for what you're going to experience and things like that. So it, it doesn't, you don't have to be carrying a 50 pound pack. In fact, you shouldn't be carrying a 50 pound pack. 30 is about as most you should be carrying. Uh, and if you take it at like a pace that's appropriate for you, I think most people will find that they can do it if they want to. But it, it does take like some planning ahead and thinking about how you're going to carry all the things you need with you. Uh, Kind of some of the areas uh, around here, at least, uh, that you might want to go uh, backpacking or places that are available for camping overnight. Uh, the, bi the big one is national forests. Uh, there's lots of them. Uh, the Angeles National Forest is right uh, north of campus. Uh, you can get to trailheads in less than an hour if you go up Highway 2. Uh, with the Angeles Forest in particular, uh, weekends and uh, especially waterfalls uh, trails can be a little bit crowded. Uh, just that just seems to be what's popular. It's an LA but, thing, uh, yeah. <laughs> I can't explain it since I'm from a state with lots of water, so I'm not I, I mean, I like waterfalls, but it's never been so uh, excessively popular, so it's always an odd thing for me. But uh, 
there, there's plenty of trailheads without them that are not going to be uh, super crowded. And one of the interesting things is that most na most national forests, uh, or I shouldn't say most, uh, but uh, Angels National Forest in particular, and many uh, as well, only need the permit for parking. So if you have something like an annual pass, uh, such as, uh, I think actually I might be getting ahead of us ourselves, uh, like the, for the national parks or something like that, then you don't need any other additional permits, which means it's a really cheap way to go camping as well. In fact, probably one of the cheapest way. Uh, some of the, uh, they do have a slightly different uh, regulations different, uh, between parks, such as the Angeles Forest, uh, need a campfire permit uh, to use stoves. Uh, it's something that you can fill out just by going to a link. It's mostly giving them your information so they know who's using stoves. But uh, it's something you want to check in with with every uh, location. I think we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, but they tend to be, uh, national forests in general tend to be less crowded than uh, parks and uh, have more wilderness areas uh, because they tend to just be like mountains that have been permitted off as national forests. And often uh, dispersed camping is something that you can do, which uh, Colin will talk about a little bit more uh, later. But national parks are also a good choice for uh, backpacking. Uh, it's just important to note that they are popular. Uh, uh, and especially in their peak seasons, and they can be crowded. Uh, they do tend to limit the amount of people that can go out into the backpacking areas to keep the wilderness areas from being overwhelmed. But that means that you might need to get a permit, you might need to get it in advance, and it can be a little bit harder. It might not be that you can just drive up there for the weekend. It really depends, though, on the park and the season. Uh, but they, they're national parks for a reason, and that they often have uh, like pretty fantastic locations to go take a look at, uh, like Yosemite. For example, uh, backpacking, you can get up to North Stone, which is just an amazing view, uh, and it's it's worth the trip. So there, there's a reason why uh, they're national parks. Uh, and they have the nice feature that amenities are often closer in that uh, national parks tend to balance the wilderness with the tourist aspect. So for example, in Yosemite, uh, you can within an hour or so drive down to the valley and uh, have a shower after your backpacking trip, which is kind of different. <laughs> Normally, if you're at out in a, a national forest that you'd have to get all the way home first. So it's an interesting balance. Uh, and then there's also state parks and forests. Uh, they tend to be a little bit different. Uh, the state, the, the passes are usually the states uh, and they may or may not have camping areas depending on the size. Uh, when they do, the campsites might be a little bit smaller or they may not have as much flexibility because national forests tend to be much larger tracts of land or states tend to have specific campsites that you're supposed to uh, make use of. Uh, so if you're going to camp there, you should check the local regulations or uh, yeah, what, what the local park is asking for what the, and what your state has, since every state's a little bit different. Uh, and more, but the, these are the main ones. Uh, uh, if you're going to go into one of these areas, uh, one of the big things you need to prepare for is check to see if there's permits. Uh, depending on the popularity of the area, depending on uh, who's uh, responsible for that land, uh, you'll need probably some sort of permit or access to uh, pass to get access. Uh, so as I mentioned with Angeles Forest, we, you just need a national parks pass or an adventure pass, which is for the forests. Uh, but some other national forests may be so popular that they are limiting access and that you have to apply for a uh, permit uh, months in advance or for a lottery system uh, to draw a permit for that year. Uh, so it really is uh, location by location and it's something that you should check in advance before you make your trip. Uh, some of them you just get them at the ranger station, some of them you get them online, uh, and some of them you, you don't need a specific permit, you just need to pass. Uh, it's also important to, with any uh, trip, but especially backpacking trips, uh, to plan ahead. Uh, uh, know before you go is the common uh, phrase uh, in that you want to double check trail conditions because they can change uh, a storm on the forecast or a uh, storm in the last weekend can cause problems uh, around uh, in Los Angeles County for example there was a lot of fires over the summer so many areas are still closed uh, not so much because of fire danger but because of the areas that are still recovering from the fire so people can't access it because they damage the uh, fragile ecosystem so that's important to just make sure that the trail's still open before you head there or the road hasn't like been washed out in the storm if you're living in an area with more frequent uh, weather events. Uh, an easy way to do that is to look up uh, trip reports on something like All Trails, uh, which is pretty much national, or uh, many states uh, have local trail associations. Uh, Washington, for example, has the Washington Trails Association or WTA, 
uh, which is fantastic. People post uh, trip reports pretty much uh, every week or so. They go out and tell you what the conditions are, what to look out for. Uh, so it's really a good idea to take advantage of other uh, campers or hikers. Uh, it's also uh, never a bad idea to check for alerts on the local, on the uh, National Park or Forest website, whoever's running the place, uh, to see if they have a shutdown or a fire or what have you. Uh, the, if, if there is something they need to be aware of, they're probably supposed to know. Uh, and when in doubt, you can always call or visit a ranger station. Uh, they'll have the most up-to-date information and they never, they'll never be upset with somebody trying to make sure that the place is still open, safe, available. Uh, and as I said earlier, uh, you always want to check the forecast. If the storm's coming, you would rather know that rather than find out. Yeah, uh, for, and then sorry, go for, it. for California, one of the main things that you should also check with is whether the creeks are dried up or not. Um, a lot of the mm. times there will be creeks that flow certain seasons of the year that won't flow other seasons. Um, there are some creeks that flow year round, so you don't have to really worry about it. Um, but if you're going to filter your own water and not have to carry all of that weight in water, you definitely want to know if there's places to refill your water. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, with backpacking, uh, because you're going to be out there for a while, you usually don't want to bring all your water with you. It's possible, but usually not more for a night or so, uh, especially if you're going to be cooking with uh, boiled water or things like that. So having a plan for where you're going to get your water from and then double checking that the water is there is really important. California, especially, as Colin said. Uh, in other climates, maybe that's more regular or reliable. Uh, and then a, a last one that uh, uh, people sometimes forget is that uh, you should plan ahead what you're going to do and then tell somebody what you're going to do. Because whenever you're planning to stay out for a couple of days, it's important that somebody knows when you're coming back, so that just in case. Uh, that way they can tell, they can call a search and rescue if you don't come back and tell them where you were going to be. Uh, hopefully that'll never be something you need. It's really rare, but it's something that you'd rather uh, you had in place just in case you ever did need it. Uh, yeah, so next uh, I'm gonna kind of go through uh, some tips and tricks on campsite selection, gear selection, and food ideas. Uh, I'm also a picture of a mini bear there, which uh, will come up in a second, uh, and why they are something you need to watch out for while that happens. Uh, so yeah, let's say, You've decided to go on a trip, you've made a pack to pack, uh, and you've gotten on the trail and you've gotten towards where you want to camp for the night. Uh, where should you where should you pitch your tent? Uh, what's, what campsite should you go with? A uh, couple of good rules of thumb are, uh, first and foremost, uh, you want to camp on durable, surmo, uh, durable surfaces, uh, uh, which really means compact dirt or sand if it's uh, you're in an area that's more deserty or uh, near a river. Uh, although you don't want to camp on a river, uh, as I'll say in a second. Uh, the reason for that is that you're not going to damage the local environment and it's not going to uh, result in like your tent sinking and pooling water overnight. So it's both good for you and good for where you are. Uh, uh, vegetation and meadow, uh, meadows especially are really sensitive uh, and can uh, take years to recover from someone pitching a tent on them. So don't camp on, uh, camp on those, even though it looks really soft. You'll both wake up wet in the morning because of all the dew and condensation, and you'll uh, destroy the meadow. Uh, and then, while it's probably obvious, uh, people occasionally do camp on the trail, and that can be really annoying if you are uh, getting out before them in the morning, or if they decide to pitch their tent really early in the day. Uh, so, avoid that. Uh, there should either there will be established campsites, or you'll be able to find uh, ones off the trail. Uh, but use, use good judgment there for what seems like a good spot to do that. Uh, uh, in California, uh, I think we have a picture in one of the next slides. It's a good idea to uh, camp away from uh, uh, grass or vegetarian bushes and things because of the condensation in the morning can be a real problem and under trees uh, is a good way to do so. Uh, but if you're, going, if you're going to camp under trees either to avoid uh, condensation or to avoid rain, uh, always make sure you look up for loose branches, especially if it's windy. Uh, that's a really uh, rude awakening if one were to fall. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's worth the quick check. Uh, another uh, good rule of thumb is to, or an important rule of thumb for uh, leaving a trace and making sure you're not stressing the environment that you're camping in is to camp at least 100 feet away from water. Or especially if you're going to, on a hill where it will flow downhill into the water. 
The reason for this is just to, uh, the, the reason for this is that in case we have like any sort of like runoff from like cooking or things like that, uh, you don't want it heading into the water and you don't want to be contaminating the water source. Uh, it's also important to know that this distance doubles if you're uh, like splashing wastewater or anything like that. Uh, that should be done at least 200 feet away from water to prevent the actual water from running into it. But it's just a, it's just a good rule of thumb to keep give a decent distance from streams and things like that. Sometimes it's not perfectly possible, but do your best. Another good reason for that too is in the winter, if you're by a stream, it's generally colder. Um, so you'll be mm -hmm. colder at night. In the summer, if you're near a stream, you have mosquitoes. Uh, yeah. So there's really not a good time where you should ever really camp right mm -hmm. next to a stream. Um, you still want to be able to access it in the morning. So ideally, you want to you want to have something that's not a super long walk so you can refill water. Um, but you definitely don't want to camp next to a stream if you can avoid it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and then and then the uh, one of one of the things uh, going to the uh, picture the chipmunk I uh, had or a mini bear, as I uh, as I called it. Uh, you want to uh, keep a distance between where you eat and cook and where you camp. Uh, and the reason for that is the smell of your food will attract wildlife. Uh, it'll more, uh, bears are the one you definitely don't want to attract, uh, as in that they can cause really ruin your trip. But mini bears, uh, as they are affectionately known, which are squirrels, chipmunks, or any other type of uh, rodent that would want to take your food, raccoons and things also do, uh, can be just as uh, harmful if they uh, decide to eat their way through your tent. Uh, so the easiest way to prevent problems from that is to both camp, in, uh, camp and eat in separate locations so that your food smell is not in your tent and to store your food and uh, any other smellables, uh, which includes things like toothpaste, uh, like flavored water, electrolytes, uh, sunscreen, uh, hand sanitizer, anything that like could potentially have a strong odor, uh, at least 50 feet away from where you're sleeping or away from your tents. Uh, it's called being bear aware, basically. Uh, you want to have it in a bear bucket, which is shown down there in the bottom left, or a bear bag, which is a bag hanging from a tree, uh, at least 12 feet above the ground and at least six feet away from the uh, trunk, uh, such that a bear or a squirrel can't easily get to it. Bear bags are a little less effective against uh, mini bears, but as long as you cinch the bag tight, it's usually pretty good because they can't exactly balance on the rope and chew at the bag. Also, the level that you have to go to really depends on where you are. Uh, surprisingly, this is kind of counterintuitive at first, but uh, well-established campsites are actually worse for dealing with this than if you're just camping in the wilderness because animals know that that's a place that they can go to get food. Um, so Yosemite, for example, national parks, um, you really have to be bear aware in national parks because um, they're just so used to having access that it just takes one or two people to mess it up and ruin it for everybody else. Um, when you're out in the wilderness or in a national forest, uh, since there's less people that do that, uh, it's less of a concern, it's still a concern, but it, you have to, it's less of a concern than if you're in an established campsite in a national park. It also though depends on the uh, like type of uh, environment you're in. So if you're in bear country, which would be like depending, uh, like, which would be more north than here. So like in forests uh, with like black bears or grizzlies wandering around, like if you're camping in Montana, you want to be very careful. Uh, it, so it really depends. Uh, you want to look at either talk to local rangers or see what uh, see what the like local websites say about the situation. I think remember like in New Mexico, it's a crime to bear uh, bear bait, which is if a bear gets into your stuff, it's a crime for both you and the bear. <laughs> I think it's a hefty fine, and the bear has to be shot. So it's like it's a good idea to take the time to set it like put everything to the side so no problems happen. So, but it. It, it's definitely something. If you're camping in Joshua Tree, like for example, there's no bears out there, but there still could be uh, rodents. So you want to keep your stuff like maybe locked in your car. But a bear is not going to smash into your car in Joshua Tree. In Yosemite, you don't want to leave your stuff in the car because a bear might smash into your car. <laughs> so it's like that. Uh, that's more for dump camping than backpacking, but the same thing applies. Uh, yeah. And then keep smellables out of your tent, which is like, don't just don't take. It's it's tempting to just like put everything into your backpack at night and then bring it into your tent, uh, especially the things that aren't food. But sunscreen, hand sanitizer, toothpaste, those all smell, so they should all go in the bear bag. 
and it's a good idea. It's a good idea to just have like a ziplock with everything that smells in it, so you can just pull it out at the end of the night and toss it in the bear bag. Uh, and if in doubt, throw it in the bear bag. If you're in like uh, heavy bear country, it's also a good idea to just leave your dishes out and like where you ate away from your tent, so that way uh, nobody's going to go digging or put them in the bag. But if you don't have space, you can just leave them out. The most somebody will do is lick it so you wash them in the morning. <laughs> Uh, all right, now kind of going into a little bit on gear selection and some of the things you'll want to bring. This is a very high level and it's a lot of this is personal preference, but just kind of some of the things that are important to have and some of the stuff you might want to consider bringing along with you. Uh, and just kind of some of the trade off. Uh, most obvious one is a bag uh, or a pack. You're going to uh, you're gonna need something to put all your stuff in, otherwise you're not backpacking. Uh, the, uh, well, I guess the, the biggest uh, thing I would stress to people that like this difference between a, hike, a hiking backpack and a backpacking backpack uh, is that you want hip straps. Uh, you want to be carrying about 80% of the weight with your hips. Otherwise your back will die <laughs> and you will really regret it. Uh, so something like a backpack that you'd wear at school or like a computer, a laptop bag is not gonna work uh, and will really hurt your hip back. Uh, luckily, any back, uh, any like backpacking bag that's big enough to carry a tent is going to have a hip strap. But it's important to like always put that on and adjust it so that you feel like most of your weight is on your hips and that the shoulder straps are mostly just keeping it stable and upright. Uh, when, if you, it's like you can tell the difference really, uh, really well between a well-adjusted bag and one that's like pulling on your shoulders too much, and it's the difference between feeling like just tired at the end of the day and feeling an agony because your shoulders hurt. And your back's like worn out, uh, so it's worth it's worth taking the time to adjust to make sure your bag fits. Uh, down the, uh, a little bit further, a little less important is the frames versus frameless debate. Uh, I tend to fall on the frame side, and that I like having the structure and the rigidity on the bag and the extra support. Uh, but Colin, for example, will tell you that the weight's not worth it, <laughs> and he'll take the more formless blob style. Uh, that's more personal preference and whether you like to be the ultra light or if you like to be a little bit more, uh, take the extra weight in the extra comfort. Uh, different people have different preferences. I don't know if you want to add to that one. Yeah, basically, yeah, I don't know how much to add, just that frameless is much lighter, but if you get a not a great frameless bag, you're going to be in a world of hurt more than if you had a framed bag. Um, mm -hmm. So usually the frames are made with either some type of metal, either like steel or if it's good carbon fiber or aluminum. Nowadays um, it's aluminum. Aluminum, yeah. So it's pretty lightweight. Um, it's for metal, um, but it's still metal, so it still weighs something. So I just I generally go with just a frameless one. Um, but if you're just starting, I wouldn't suggest doing that because um, you have to get a really good frameless one that fits. Otherwise, it's not fun. So. Yeah. It's also become a little bit more personal preference as technology has improved. Uh, back in the day, they used to be these massive metal frames, and now that's just not really a thing anymore. So, mm -hmm. frame framed bags have become a lot lighter, and frameless bags have become better, smart, more smartly designed. So, it's become a little bit more personal preference. Uh, the other one that's easy to forget because you usually don't bother with this when hiking is to have a bag cover, uh, which is pictured on the right. Uh, basically, if it rains, you don't want your stuff getting wet, and you especially don't want your sleeping bag getting wet. So it's important to cover it up. Uh, a good bag cover would be something like that, where, uh, shown on the right, where it hugs the backpack uh, and is basically clings tight, so you don't have to worry about it falling off. But uh, if you are just starting out, a trash bag will work in a pinch. Uh, it'll just look a little funny. Uh, but really, any, anything that keeps your uh, gear dry is what you want. And in fact, actually, a trash bag is a good uh, solution keeping sleeping bags and other things dry if you're expecting to go somewhere really wet and rainy. Uh, it's not a bad idea to wrap your sleeping bag in a trash bag for that extra protection because nothing is worse than having a wet sleeping bag at the end of the day and potentially dangerous depending on how cold it is. Uh, boots are probably your next most important thing. Uh, again, this there's a lot of personal preference at play here. Uh, some people like the lighter weight boots. Uh, some people like the heavy duty with uh, lots of ankle support. Uh, a lot of people kind of fall somewhere in between. Some people try it with their tennis shoes. I wouldn't recommend that. You'll get blisters. Uh, but whatever kind of works for you. Uh, 
the things I, I would recommend are have waterproof if you can, uh, just because uh, having wet socks uh, when you're hiking for multiple days really sucks. And uh, having some ankle support can really help, especially if your back's on the heavier side uh, and you're doing longer, longer duration. Uh, I think I saw a message in the chat. Oh, no, never mind. Uh, and then uh, going along, uh, other things that you'll want to bring, uh, you'll need to have clothes. Uh, you don't, technically, you don't need to change the clothes. Most people prefer it. Uh, but uh, having, uh, the key is to not bring too many changes of clothes. Uh, you really want to plan on rewearing stuff uh, to keep your weight down and keep your volume down. Uh, but the good rule of thumb for any outdoors things, but especially with backpacking, is the cotton is rotten. Uh, have wool and synthetics, uh, down fleece, uh, anything other than cotton that'll dry faster uh, and have something breathable and plan on layering. And then uh, uh, the last thing on this uh, page uh, is that uh, when you're out, if you're going to be out there for more than a day, you probably will need a trowel and some GP. Uh, so uh, plan ahead and uh, also have some hand sanitizer uh, for when you uh, are either cooking or anytime you need to clean clean up because there won't be running water <laughs> and you won't want to be spending any of your hard pump water. Uh, let's see, moving on. Uh, sleeping bag and pad are an important com uh, component to bring with you. Uh, you want something lightweight but warm. Uh, there's very, depending on how cold you're going, you depends on how heavy duty your sleeping bag needs to be. Uh, there, there's usually degree ratings, uh, and they're usually pretty like, if it says 20 degree bags, it usually means you won't freeze to death at 20 degrees, but you won't be comfortable. Uh, so some people will like to do something like add a bag liner, which is a lightweight, uh, lightweight kind of like additional, like kind of, uh, uh, little, like basically like a blanket that goes inside the bag, uh, that adds like 10 degrees or something to make it a little bit warmer. Uh, the other thing is you just wear extra layers to bed. Uh, is a great way to stay warm at night without having to bring too heavy. Uh, down is a, for that, as you can also put a um, those, those little hand warmer chemical things like the bags. Uh, if it, you know it's going to be cold, bring a few of those and just break them right before you go to bed and put them by your feet. It really mm -hmm. helps a lot. Yep, that's a good one. That's a good trick as well. Uh, see. Uh, the two main options between that is down, which tends to work, have colder ratings, but can't get wet or it won't work uh, and doesn't dry fast uh, versus synthetic. Uh, again, this is something that's become a little bit more personal preference because they've kind of approached each other uh, as uh, people have gotten better at making them. Uh, and then you'll also want to have a pad on the ground or otherwise uh, you'll be in for a cold and hard night. Uh, the foam versus blow up debate is mostly personal preference at this point. Uh, Blow up can be a little bit lighter and less bulky, uh, but some people like using the foam because it's simpler, and some people like using taking out their foam pads as like something to sit on outside and then dust off. Uh, pillows, uh, don't bring them, just use your clothes. <laughs> uh, they, they never seem to work as well as advertised, and they always seem, they seem like they're extra weight in uh, space. You can always just bundle up a couple shirts, and it works as a great pillow. Uh, tents, uh, Tents are interesting when backpacking in that they're the only time I see people actually use the man rating on tents. Uh, for example, pictured here is a two man tent, which looks like it's gonna be a tight space and it, it is, but it's definitely possible. I, I'm 6'6 I'm six, six and I, I fit in a two man tent with somebody else. So uh, you definitely can do it. It's just, uh, you'll, become, uh, you'll become best buddies with your tent buddy. Uh, it, but it's a it's if you want to if you want to save weight uh, using the actual man rating on your tent is a really good way to do so, and it actually helps you stay warm uh, with the extra if you fill up the tent all the way, uh, because normally having a warmer tent is heavier. A uh, three season tent means it's good for spring, summer, and fall. Uh, the four season tent that's good for winter can be a lot heavier, but uh, as shown here, I think uh, Colin can probably explain a little bit more. It can have a drawback if you don't bring it. Yeah, so this was actually the trip I did around New Year's um, this year. Uh, it was only supposed to get to like 40 at night. Obviously, it got below 40. Um, that's basically just condensation off of your breath will freeze uh, on the inside of the tent. And when you wake up, it's not pleasant because you warm it up and then it melts and it's really cold. Um, so if you're going to be camping in 
like ice or snow, definitely recommend getting a warmer tent. The difference can make it, it can be substantial. Uh, and then I also want to point out to make things fit, you can always put gear in these uh, vestibules, which are kind of the like spot where the rain fly extends over the entrance. A lot of backpacking tents have them. The idea is like you put your pack there so that it's not taking up space inside your tent because there's only room for you in your pack, sleeping bag if you're filling it up all the way. And that's a good way to keep your pack dry while uh, keeping it not while keeping it outside the tent. Uh, and then, yeah, we talked a little bit about water. So uh, if you're going pack backpacking, you're probably going to want to get water from where you're going, which means you're going to need a filter of some sort, either one that you pump, uh, which means sitting on a rock and uh, pumping a lot of water and filling up water bottles. Uh, a bag, which is one where you can scoop up water and then either hang it on a tree and let gravity do its magic or squeeze it. Uh, and then the uh, last resort, which is always good to have a backup, but uh, tastes terrible, as iodine tablets, which is where you scoop up water. And as long as it's not doesn't have, have too much like heavy elements or dirt and stuff in it, you can just drop iodine or fill in bacteria in it. Uh, but it tastes disgusting. Still, it's good to have just in case your pump breaks or gets contaminated. Uh, as like a backup plan so that you're not stuck with dirty water. I just don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend it as plan A. And then uh, final thing on gear, uh, we're going a little bit slow, so I'm gonna uh, kind of speed through some of this, is uh, uh, you're gonna want to cook at some point. Uh, so you'll probably need to bring a stove. Uh, the main thing with backpacking is you just wanna boil water uh, and add it to your food, uh, which means that, uh, You'll probably want a stove like a jet boil or a pocket rocket, which are pretty much the lightweight stoves designed for boiling water and not much else. Uh, I, I like the jet boil a lot because it packs up into its little mug and it's kind of slick uh, and it has these heating fins for extra fast heating. Uh, but it's good to note that uh, usually open flames are not an option, so you'll want to have a camp stove because usually there's a burn in any place, especially in California. Uh, so you can't just build a fire and cook with that. Uh, mess kits uh, are usually a bit of a luxury. Uh, normally you just bring like a bowl or a Tupperware or like a single piece of dish and a spork and call it a day. Uh, less dishes is better. And you don't really, you don't really want to be carrying a lot around a lot of plates as though there's no point. Uh, if it's raining or uh, I guess really sunny out when you're cooking, uh, tarps can be a great way to make uh, cooking a lot more pleasant and just having, being in camp in general. Uh, so it's good to have that in ropes if you're expecting a bad weather uh, so that you can string up a tarp real quick and uh, make your life a lot more bearable. Uh, and then finally, the uh, it's always good to pack the tent essentials when going out for any outdoor thing, uh, backpacking in particular, uh, which is to have a pocket knife, a flashlight, food, water, rain gear, sun protection, change of clothes, fire starter, map and compass. You can't get away with GPS, but old school mapping compass that I, I like better because it can't break uh, or not as easily and a first aid kit. This is just more so that way for basic emergencies you're prepared just in case. Uh, let's see here. On the subject of food, uh, it's usually a trade-off between uh, weight and taste, uh, whereas lightweight things are lightweight, which is great, but they usually are bland. Uh, Freeze-dried is the best, such as this uh, mountain house on the right which is like uh, the iconic brand of uh, Just Add Water. Uh, it's better than it, you think it would be, but it's not fantastic. Uh, anything though dry tends to be uh, lighter than anything with, uh, with water included. So uh, dehydrated beans, hummus, uh, couscous, mashed, instant mashed potatoes, instant pastas, something like that tends to be a lightweight way to uh, cook on the trail. Uh, Anything where you're just you're pumping water out of a stream, boiling it and pouring it in tends to be about as good as you can do. Uh, and then you can do things like bring Tabasco or something like that, sort of like a little bit of seasoning to toss on. Uh, when after a day of hiking, you're pretty much hungry enough to eat anything. Uh, other things that are like um, have a lot of food for their uh, for their weight is stuff like cheese, nuts, trail mix. Uh, these tend to be pretty energy dense foods, so tend to get you a long way for how much you're carrying. Uh, other ideas are you can do things like fajitas with tortillas. Uh, no dishes is for always a plus when backpacking, sometimes worth, worth carrying the extra weight. Uh, you can do things like carry eggs in a Ziploc bag so you don't have to have the shells or any cartons, and then you just drop them in a pot and boil them. That is a little bit on the heavy side though, because eggs have a lot of water in them, but it's something that can be fun for like the first day or like 
uh, first morning if you're freezing in advance. Uh, Gogurt's a fun trick that I like using uh, in that you can freeze them and then use them as ice packs if you have anything cold you're trying to preserve. And then in the morning, they'll have uh, melted and you can have them for breakfast. Uh, and then finally, uh, they're way slightly. Uh, uh, one trick that I've always uh, found kind of fun, uh, you need to have reliable running water, is that uh, if you have a bear bucket and you put it in a river, you basically have refrigeration for as long as you stay in that can say, it's kind of a fun, fun idea. And then my last thing uh, is just uh, leave no trace is an important thing to take, keep in mind, which is mainly that uh, the idea is that we want to leave where we are as good as we found or better. Uh, so whatever we bring in, we need to pack out, which means that you don't want to bring stuff that's producing lots of trash and you want to compress it into a single trash bag and keep it with you. So uh, don't like, be careful when you're ripping off uh, wrappers, try to keep them in one piece and immediately put in the trash bag, don't litter. But most of this is common sense. Uh, as well as the rest of the principles, which is planning ahead and preparing means that you're less likely to have an emergency, which is less likely to produce litter or any other uh, trash. Uh, traveling camp on durable surfaces, leave what you find. Uh, minimize uh, uh, campfire impacts. Uh, usually that means there's a burn ban, so don't use any campfires. But if if you're allowed to, try to like be careful and spread it out. Uh, respect wildlife and be conscious of other visitors. Cool. Yeah, so I'll take it over from here. Um, for backpacking in Southern California, there's actually quite a few options. Um, if you want something that just, if you're just trying to get started, and you want something that's easier, I uh, would definitely recommend looking for campgrounds off of Highway 2, as we mentioned earlier, uh, Los, Los Angeles National Forest and Los, Pod, Los Padres National Forest. Um, those three areas are really, uh, the LA National Forest and the uh, those Padres, I absolutely love. They're, they're fantastic. This picture behind me actually is a picture from uh, Cespe Creek, which is in Los Padres. Um, and that was a, it was a fantastic backpacking trip. I'll talk about it later. Um, if you want something with higher difficulty, you want to look for uh, secluded spots. So you're going to mainly find these just in national forests, like what Jimmy was saying earlier with dispersed camping. Um, stay 100 feet away from streams. Try not to be visible from the trails if you can. Um, definitely don't camp on the trails. Um, you want to be greater than one mile away from a designated campsite. It doesn't really make too much sense if you're trying to do like this stealthish camping next to a campsite. Um, so just make sure you're far enough away where you don't run into people. Uh, leave no trace, be bear aware, and then also just tr uh, don't camp in meadow meadows like we were talking about earlier. Okay, next slide. Okay, so uh, for local short trips, um, Pasadena is kind of down in the lower right. Um, this, this 210, which goes right through Pasadena, if you go right on the two, uh, I, I could walk through this on all trails. This is just a screenshot from all trails. But if you look, there's these bunch of these little triangles, not the ones that are filled in, those are mountains, but the other ones are triangles. And if you kind of hover over them, they'll show you trails and ratings and how many people have done them. Um, so you can see like for this one, the Switzer Falls Trail, it's a waterfall trail, so it's going to be really crowded on weekends. Uh, but you can see that you could pretty easily do a, a two to three mile hike down to a campsite, camp there, and then leave in the morning. Um, so you're, you're three miles away from the road. Um, so it's pretty low risk that way. Um, and there's a bunch of campsites like that all along the two. Um, so just check out all trails and you can uh, find a trail that works for you that way. Oh, okay, next slide. Um, for the campgrounds, you want to look and see if they're currently closed because of there's a huge fire that went through this area about a year ago. Um, so you need to make sure that they're open. Um, and it'll also tell you um, like what kind of amenities they have um, and if you can, you can camp there or what, what kind of permits you need to camp there. Cool. Okay, so Mount Wilson, um, this is one of our local mountains. Um, it's, it's a 14.8 mile hike that goes through the Little Santa Anita Canyon. It's 5,000 foot elevation gain, so it's pretty steep. There's a waterfall on the trail. Um, it's open year round because there isn't much snow at these altitudes. Um, if you are backpacking, you're gonna have to probably camp at a campsite in this for this trail. Um, it's fairly busy. Um, these other ones I listed here are closed. Uh, right now, are there like 
they either open and close kind of regularly. So you're going to want to check, but Chantry Flats, Spruce Grove, Hodges, these are all like, uh, Hodges is a campsite. So just kind of check online and see if these are open before you decide to go. So this is the one that I did at New Year's. Um, it's Sespe Hot Springs, it's by Ojai. It's about a two hour drive from here. Uh, it's pretty flat. You only have 1600 foot elevation game over 35 miles. Um, so there's some up and down, but not too much. Um, we did it in two and a half days. I would recommend doing it in three just so you have more time. Um, at the end, there's a hot springs 11 miles in. It's kind of, it's not a great one. So we didn't even stop at that one. Um, but 17 miles in at the end, uh, it's an out and back trail. Uh, you have the Sespe hot springs, which is pictured in the lower right. Um, these get really hot, so it's actually it's like a jacuzzi level. Uh, you can actually get to like boiling water level, but you don't want to get in that because it's just too hot. Um, <laughs> would not recommend. I, I touched it and I was like, nope. Um, so yeah, so there's hot springs at the end that you can uh, kind of chill out in. Um, it's well trafficked, but um, it's it's a big enough trail where we didn't run into that many problems with passing people, especially right now with COVID. Um, when I went, which is in January, it was very cold. It was um, I definitely didn't bring enough stuff. So if you do do it in winter, uh, would definitely recommend um, bringing some more warm gear. Um, there's There wasn't any cell reception for me. I have T-Mobile. Um, so that's another thing to keep in mind if you do decide to do this, make sure that people know where you're going. Um, and always check with the rangers about the water flow. Um, for this hike, there's tons of water. Uh, so we didn't really have that problem too much. Yeah, so another, another trail. Uh, is Mount Baldy. Um, this is a little steeper. It's 4,200 feet, but it's only 14 miles. Um, it's a one hour drive. Uh, you're definitely going to want to watch out for snow in the winter uh, because it's it's pretty high pretty high elevation. You're, you're going to get snow up there. Um, and from what I've seen, there's I, I haven't done this one personally, but uh, it gets also pretty windy up at the summit. Cool. Yeah, so this is another one. Uh, this one's in Mount Jacinto, which is it's like a two hour drive from here. I think it's in, I think it's south from here. Um, it's very steep. You're going to be want to be a little bit more experienced if you do this, especially in the winter. You're going to have to use micro spikes, which are uh, spikes that stick on the bottom of your shoes. Um, you can get a permit from Idle Wild. Um, it's either free, it's, it's free or low cost for backpacking. Um, Last time I checked, they're closed right now. So just if you want to do this one, just check to see it when they open. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is uh, San Bernardino Mountains. So this is also pretty close, one and a half miles or one and a half hours away. Um, relatively short, but also a pretty good elevation gain. Um, there, this is in uh, a San Bernardino National Forest. So there's you really only just need an adventure pass for this. Um, it looks like it's temporarily closed right now, so I'll also check back in on this one later. Cool. So this is one that this most of my favorite hikes in the Santa Monica Malibu area are along the Backbone Trail. Um, this is a stretch of land that goes 64 miles from Santa Monica to Point Magoo. Um, you could do the whole thing in four to five days if you're ambitious. Um, it's a 13,000 foot elevation gain. You basically go up and down every single mountain in the Santa Monica Mountains. Um, so it's not for the faint of heart, uh, especially in the summer, it gets really hot. There's not much water. Uh, what I would recommend is you can, there's certain campsites you can actually camp at. Um, so just hike sections of it. Um, kind of find sections along this trail that you like. Um, I haven't done the full thing yet. I've only done half of it, um, but it was, uh, these are all pictures from when I did it. Uh, you get amazing views of Los Angeles if you're near the Santa Monica side. Um, there's creeks, there's, you can look over and see the valleys. It's really pretty. Uh, and you get cell service for most of it. Yeah, so yep, Yosemite, there's tons of trails in Yosemite. National Park website's a good place to start. Um, it's right here. Uh, basically, this is one that we did uh, with Caltech Y, which is, it's, they call it like the, the potato chip or Pringle you. Um, you can basically like, it, it's just, there's nothing, every, every single picture you see of Yosemite is just absolutely beautiful. And it's that way really in person as well. Um, so I can't recommend Yosemite enough. Um, 
just make sure that uh, a lot of the places you do have to have reservations for. Um, and you can't kind of do this dispersed camping in the valley. I get to camp at campgrounds. So yeah, keep that in mind as well. Cool. And the last thing I'm just going to kind of summarize other places you could look. Uh, we have a national park off the coast that is one of the least visited national parks in the US. Um, it's the Channel Islands National Park. Um, Catalina is not part of that, but um, Catalina is an island off the coast. Um, you can take the Catalina Flyer, Catalina Express. There's a city on that island called Avalon. Um, you can either hang there or you can uh, you can actually do, do a hike that goes along the entire crest of Catalina Island, uh, which is, I've never done it, but I've seen pictures and it's amazing and I've had friends do it. Um, for Santa Cruz Island, uh, this is in Channel Islands National Park. Uh, Scorpion um, is a, it's a, har it's a small harbor that you can get a ferry to. Um, and there's some great backpacking. This is actually from Santa Cruz Island. Um, you'll be hard pressed to find a darker place in or near LA. Um, you can see, especially on a new moon, the stars are incredible from Santa Cruz Island. Uh, for the High Sierras, which are near Yosemite, um, Kearsarge Pass is one that I did uh, about a year and a half ago. Um, absolutely beautiful. It's super high elevation though, so if you get altitude sick, um, that's something that you should definitely think about. Um, another option is uh, there's a bunch of coastal routes you can do, so like Santa Barbara, Santa Cruz, Big Sur, all along PCH along the coast. Um, although I think Big Sur just had got cut off <laughs> with uh, PCH, so you're gonna have to look into that if you want to do that. But um, a lot of places along the coast are great backpacking spots as well. And by PCH, you mean Pacific Coast Highway, right? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I, I'm a California native, but yeah, it's Pacific Coast Highway. Which had a landslide recently, right? That's why. Yeah, so I think that's everything that I have to cover. Mm -hmm. uh, at this point, if anyone has any questions, we'd be happy to answer or uh, you know, talk about other uh, you know, stories we have or things that we enjoyed. We kind of talked for a little bit, though, so I want to see if open it up for questions. I can probably stop the recording here too as well while we're 